on the Sunday after the Feast of Theophany and the commemoration of St. John, the 6th and 7th of January. I had decided this actually quite a while back. I decided to offer this to you about a week or so before Christmas. Now, as much as I am a person of methodology and preparation, I can't claim that I quite prepare my sermons a month in advance. I am not that good. In fact, I am not good at all. But I had decided to offer this sermon to you today precisely because of the example that St. John the Baptist offers to each and every one of us by the words that I had just quoted from him. The reason why I was moved to speak about this is because I had noticed a common theme that was appearing in many of you during confessions. Hence the name and the title of my sermon today, Humility and Confidence. I had noticed that many of you struggle struggle with almost like a teeter-totter experience on how to be confident, yet at the same time remain humble. Frequently, as we seek humility, being Christians striving to follow in the footsteps of Christ, we find ourselves disturbed by our confidence and we don't know how to apply it sometimes even feeling guilty for being confident and this is a challenging experience for us I can't say whether or not this was a challenging experience a hundred years ago or a thousand years ago, or two thousand years ago, for people who are striving to live the Christian way. But I know it is a struggle today. It is a struggle today precisely because we are taught incessantly to be confident we are taught to be confident by being taught to believe in ourselves. You're probably already getting the gist of my sermon. That's my whole point. So I'd like to read to you a short passage from the Gospel according to John, where the evangelist John, where he describes a, a larger point in, a, in a, his third chapter about the interaction between John, who baptized Jesus, and Jesus, and then later on between John and his many, many disciples. Please bear with me. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above 
is above all. Once again, this is St. John the Baptist speaking of Jesus, clarifying for everybody that he himself is not the Messiah that they had been waiting for. You see, many of John's followers, disciples, were starting to question and people in general were asking themselves, could this be the Messiah about John? Because his ministry was fantastic. His life of exemplary humility and at the same time his preaching with boldness and without any fear of reprimand inspired so many that they were followers of him all throughout the land and they were accepting a baptism, something sort of new to them and he was explaining it in a way in a way that was mysterious. They weren't quite getting it, and yet people still were following him. He was speaking about this baptism by water that he was offering to everyone, assuring them at the same time that someone else was going to baptize them with a greater baptism. referring to Jesus Christ and Christ's ministry and the fullness of baptism that you and I receive today after Christ received the baptism from John. But you see, this is exactly the experience that people of that time must have had. On the one hand, they see St. John being completely humbled in his everyday life about all aspects of daily, of daily living. Yet on the other hand, he is speaking with such boldness and courage, unafraid of anything and anyone, which ultimately even led to his martyrdom. You and I have something to learn from St. John here about this experience of growing in confidence while at the same time increasing our humility. We acquire knowledge and skills throughout our lives. We do that by learning and by practice. And we become better and better at various activities. You know what you can do well. A person who learns how to cook and cooks day after day, intentionally wanting and desiring to prepare better food for those who are hungry around him or her, gets better at it. And that person knows that he or she has become good at it. A carpenter knows that by practicing and learning new techniques and routines, he or she will get better at it. And the house or the table or the chair that he builds will be better and stronger. And he knows that. And he should know that. And we want all people in all trades to speak confidently to be confident in the growth and the learning that they acquire. I've heard this example once. You probably have too. Let's say you are ill. You are in serious trouble. And you need to go to a doctor to see a surgeon. And the surgeon is supposed to go inside your body to fix something. Do you want the surgeon to come to you and tell you that, well, I think I can do this. Or do you want the surgeon to say, I have done such and such number of these surgeries. I have studied. I am careful to prepare myself from the night before or from days earlier. I have studied your condition specifically on you as my patient 
for a couple of weeks now. And I will go in and do my very best. And I will perform this surgery well for you. That's what you want. At least that's what I want. I want someone who has prepared himself or herself to truly, truly be useful to my well-being. As we begin to grow in confidence, however, as we begin to grow in that confidence that I have described, the devil who does not sit idle will begin to tempt us with that insidious ill of pride. With pride, each and every one of us is challenged every day. And we fail. And we make mistakes. Even the best of the very best in any field has made mistakes and is likely to make mistakes again, even after they have become the best in the world. And now humility comes in. We are humbled by force when we make mistakes particularly if we have gone into uh, that respective activity with nothing but haughty pride because we have become good and we have allowed the confidence to become our confidence rather than our ability with the presence of God. And it's a good thing that we're humbled because if we do not have Christ as an example of humility, if we did not have John the Baptist as an example of humility parallel to his confidence, we would slide into major depression, would we not, after a mistake? we would go into a state of mind that sees nothing but the brokenness instead of the good that has been accomplished. Brothers and sisters, when our confidence is in Christ, it continues to grow. When we place our confidence in our own abilities, it's not even so much that we eliminate this idea of God providing the support to our knowledge and to our experience. In fact, we become our own gods. We become our own gods whenever we say that we believe in ourselves. If I believe in myself, I am my own God. And you see, when I make myself a God, all I can be sure to offer is a broken God. I can only offer someone who is not omnipotent. I can only offer someone who is not the one who fulfills and completes everything. Because in spite of the knowledge and experience and confidence that I can offer, when I present just myself without God in me, and focus clearly in my mind 
I offer the next person who seeks my help only someone who is likely to fail. <coughs> Imperfect God is not what we need to offer the world. Instead, whatever I am good at, whatever I have developed confidence that I can offer to the world around me, I want to offer with Christ God. Let me share with you just one more line from Saint Nicodemus of the Holy Mountain. He says in one of his daily meditations, there is no other time within my power except the present. Therefore, I must immediately repent now because later I may not be able to repent. You've all heard the words, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Not just Jesus the Lord, but St. John the Baptist taught that in his time as well. And all of the apostles and all the fathers and mothers of the church throughout history urge us essentially to be ready, to be ready at any moment. Not to be ready with a crippling fear of death, but to be ready understanding that I only have control now. I know that I can do something now. I do not know what I will be able to do tomorrow. I seek to know. I plan my days in advance. I strive to organize my life, and all those are good things. But in all truth, it is what I offer today. So I'll close with this, brothers and sisters. The famous verse from Philippians chapter 4, verse 3. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen.